Hey everyone, it's David with Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. So I've got a really fun video for us today. I just completed uh, processing data from my second full session with the StellarView SVX90T, and uh, I captured this data all broadband, four hours worth of broadband data, just a few nights ago on uh, the evening of May 31st into June 1st, 2024. And uh, in my last video, I did a combination of uh, some open clusters and some nebula, all in the, in the same region, but I used narrowband. This time, I targeted open clusters, and I used just broadband. And I have to tell you, uh, if you're not currently imaging star fields and open clusters and globular clusters, you're really missing out. And, um, you, you know, it's not just about nebula and galaxies. You know, I know a lot of us love those, so do I, I love those objects too, but I, but I, I love equally uh, the star fields. And uh, when you think about it, our galaxy, uh, the, the number of stars and star groupings in our galaxy far outnumbers all the other DSO types combined. So, uh, and frankly, these targets make for some really awesome images. And not just that, um, these are targets that should you choose to observe and not image, you can actually, uh, you know, most of these targets you, you can see in your telescope and you can actually observe them. And I think that's a pretty cool thing to note. So with that, in today's video, I'm going to uh, cover a grab I made in Cassiopeia and it's uh, let's call it a cluster of clusters and that's going to include M103 which is Messier's last his final cataloged object and uh, it also goes by NGC 581 but then we've got several other cool clusters like the Yin Yang cluster which is NGC 659 we have uh, Coldwall 10 uh, or NGC 63 uh, which is nicknamed the lawnmower cluster I kid you not and then NGC 654, which is the fuzzy butterfly uh, open cluster. And finally, last but not least, we have Trumpler 1. No, that's not a political statement, actually. It's a real open cluster in the constellation of Cassiopeia, and it's part of this frame. So we're going to take a look at it. And uh, so we have a lot to do today, and uh, I'm going to um, do a twist on my normal presentation. Normally, I would just jump into my session notes and, you know, go over the details that, you know, that uh, of the session so that everybody's up to speed. But I thought it'd be much cooler this time if I actually gave you a time lapse and cover those details uh, of the entire uh, time lapse, a two minute time lapse of the entire four hours of this session. And so we're going to do that first. And then afterwards, we'll, 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 we'll take a look at the final image as it was processed. I'll, talk, I'll highlight the uh, workflow that I use to get the result that I present. And then naturally, we'll, we'll, we'll take a deep, a deep dive into the astronomy uh, behind this image. And uh, I think it's a gorgeous, uh, gorgeous uh, capture with the Stellar View SVX 90T. I'm very pleased with the telescope for those who are interested. And um, I hope you guys enjoy this video. So let's get right to it. Most of us realize that an astrophotograph is usually not a single exposure. Rather, astrophotographs are created from many sub-exposures that we later stack together to produce a final image. Now, the collection of sub-exposures we call a data set, and the act of collecting the data is what we call a session. So this astrophotograph was created from a data set of 480 sub-exposures, and I captured these sub-exposures with my StellarView SVX 90T telescope and an ASI 2600mm Pro camera. Now that camera is a monochrome camera, so to get color, I needed to also use filters. I used a ZWO broadband filters in this case, which is luminance, red, green, and blue. So this session lasted four hours because each exposure was 30 seconds long. And I've condensed that down into a two-minute time lapse. And I did that because I think it gives you a greater appreciation for what goes into making a single astrophotograph. 
So I started my session using an IRUV cut filter, and this filter limits the photon striking the sensor to the visible light spectrum, and that means it's blocking infrared and ultraviolet data. And it's actually the broadest filter used in the session, and we call this data our luminance data. Now I love that you can see these satellites streaking through the frame, but it is a bit alarming, I mean, to see how much traffic we have up there. I mean, this is a random 2.5 by 1.7 degree field of view of sky and we're getting streaks every few seconds and that means that in real time that's every few minutes we have a satellite passing through this view so as we move through the red and the green data Take note on how the frame seems to jump around a bit. Well, that's dithering, and this is a technique of making small adjustments to the telescope's position every few exposures. And what that does is it improves signal to noise ratio by reducing the fixed pattern noise that we know exists uh, on all of these sensors. So I dither every three frames. Now, for purposes of illustrating the variability of the background signal itself, I removed normalization from this time lapse for the blue data. And, uh, you know, this time what I did is I registered the 120 uh, sub exposures of the blue signal so that the stars are also aligned. Look how at the end the moon continues to rise and the background signal is flooded. Hey, but no worries, because that's why we have software and mathematics and statistics. We can stack these images to create, you know, these masters. And uh, here we have the IR uh, or the luminance uh, stack. We have the red stack. We have the uh, green stack. We have the blue stack and they look gorgeous. So cool, you've got some great stacks, but to get those stacks and turn them into a beautiful color picture, you're gonna need to do some processing. I do all my processing in Pix Insight, and for broadband data, it, it really couldn't be simpler. I follow a methodology that starts with alignment. It moves to a dynamic crop. You're then gonna do some form of background extraction to eliminate gradients. I use the gradient correct, correction tool. I then do an RGB combine on the linear data. I then do a plate solve and a spectrographic uh, uh, color calibration so that the stars, uh, the red, the green, and the blue stars are balanced in terms of color. I then apply a uh, screen transfer function stretch which I then pull into the histogram um, uh, levels tool and I apply it to create a nonlinear data image. So now I have a stretched color image. That stretched color image, I will apply a little bit of noise reduction to it to take out the noise that's inherent in all these photographs. And then um, if I uh, feel that the, there, there's a need to, I might take that into uh, another product like GIMP uh, some might use Photoshop, and I might adjust uh, some of the saturation and or final levels. And that's it. Okay, what a beautiful photograph this is. Um, I, I think it captures a fascinating region in the constellation Cassiopeia. And uh, this is an area that is home to not only several beautiful open star clusters, but there are tons of double stars here uh, and other stellar um, uh, gems that, 
you know, if you haven't checked out Cassiopeia uh, recently with a wide field refractor like the Stellar View SVX90T, you know, it's definitely worth uh, doing. And uh, even with an eyepiece, you don't have to image. You can just go out there with an eyepiece. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about the objects that are in this image. And, you know, obviously first up is M103, Messier 103. It's one of the youngest and smallest open clusters in Cassiopeia. It's located about 8,000 light years away from us. It's very compact, but it's rich in stars. There's over 170 in the cluster. And uh, some of the brightest stars here are these red giants. And I love that because it creates a beautiful color, beautiful reddish hue uh, within the cluster. And it's a relatively young cluster. It's about 25 million years old. They estimate 12 to 25 million years old. And uh, just a fun fact on this one, this was the last item that was formally added by Charles Messier to his catalog. Um, and uh, objects 104 through 109 are, are, were actually footnotes that he left, which later in 1921 were uh, formally amended in the catalog, uh, but not by Charles Messier. So next, uh, you know, we have um, uh, NGC 663, which is, of course, the lawnmower um, a, a cluster, which I don't get it. You know, I don't see a lawnmower here. Rather, I, I just see a, a, a large and a, a pretty rich open cluster. It's about 7,000 light years from Earth. Um, it is a beautiful uh, cluster, and a lot of people confuse it for M103, believe it or not, um, because of its you know size. It's it's uh, got about 400 stars, but a lot of these stars are younger and, and are young and blue, and uh, which you know indicates a relatively young astronomical age. And uh, this cluster is much bigger than M103. It's 16 arc minutes, uh, you know, uh, in terms of its uh, size in the sky. And it's uh, definitely one of the larger clusters in Cassiopeia. And it's about the same age uh, as M103. You know, it's thought to be around 20 million years old. Now, uh, not too far away, we will find the Yin and the Yang cluster, NGC 659. Now, this is clearly smaller and it's less dense when compared to... Uh, NGC 663 or M103, but it's still impressive, and it's about 8,000 light years away. It contains a mixture of stars, some young and, and some, uh, uh, you know, young bright stars, and some are older and fainter. And that diversity um, uh, gives this cluster this varied appearance. And I think this is why the yin and the yang. Uh, name uh, where it comes from, where the brighter star, you know, uh, you know, there's a bright and a dark half to this to this cluster, and um, you know, it's approximately 40 million years old, um, and uh, and again, around 8,000 light years away. Now, if we go to the very top of the um, of this frame, there's another cluster which is uh, uh, NGC 654. Now that is the fuzzy butterfly uh, open cluster. And, um, you know, interestingly uh, uh, enough, this one's about 7,800 light years away. And it contains several massive stars that are, that, you know, uh, that are rapidly rapidly evolving. And these are much larger and more luminous uh, uh, stars than our own sun. And they add to the uh, cluster's overall brightness and, and its visual appeal. And uh, this is also young. It's around 14 million years old. So definitely a cool cluster. And, um, you know, uh, last but, but not least, again, we have Trumpler 1. And this is a smaller, and uh, and when I say Trumpler 1, uh, just to be clear, this is TR1. Trumpler was an astronomer who actually uh, cataloged a number of uh, more loosely bound uh, undocumented clusters, and this is uh, Trumpler 1. And this is a smaller, it's loosely bound, It's uh, uh, especially when compared to the others in this frame. It's located about 8,500 light years away. And it doesn't have a lot of bright stars. It has some, and they and they kind of line up, interestingly enough, in a charming, you know, kind of pattern here. Uh, it's a more delicate uh, looking cluster than the rest, 
And it, but it's a great example of how diverse open clusters can be in terms of star density, distribution, uh, shape, color. And uh, Trumpler 1 is the uh, oldest of the group here uh, of the clusters in this cluster. And they're, it's about 60 million years old. So, um, you know, look, what a wonderful region of the sky, uh, a great area for stellar exploration, uh, uh, especially if you own one of these uh, Stellar View SV90Ts or similarly uh, sized refractors. So definitely a very cool area to take your telescope out and either observe or image. Okay, folks, let's call that a wrap. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you liked the time-lapse sequence. I hope you liked the astronomical tour. Um, I do enjoy making these videos. I find it to be a great way for me to share my passion for this hobby. And if you are into astronomy and all things astrophotography, please do subscribe. It really does keep me motivated, keeps me creating new videos. And for all of you who are already subscribed, thank you so much. I really appreciate the likes and the comments and please keep them coming. I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, provide insight if it's gonna be useful to folks. So thank you so much for all, all of the support. And with that, I will see everyone on the next video.